Okay, let's talk about monetary policy right now. So monetary policy in very easy terms is effectively the use of interest rates uh, to meet some macroeconomic objectives, okay? So remember fiscal policy was the use of government's budget to meet some macroeconomic objectives. Monetary policy is the use of interest rates to meet some macroeconomic objectives, okay? I mean, it, it, it says reserves here, but for the time being, let's ignore this, okay? Let's try to make things as simple as possible. Okay, so effectively what the government is going to do, it's going to increase or decrease the interest rate, whichever is needed to meet its macroeconomic objectives. We've talked about what macroeconomic objectives can be. It can be either to cause growth or let's say increase Y. It can be price stability where we don't want a 0% inflation, but we don't want wild fluctuations in price level. Or three, we could want to, uh, let's say, reduce unemployment. Or I mean, there can be other macroeconomic objectives, but these are the three main ones that the governments uh, usually tend to have. Uh, so, in order to achieve either one of these or a combination of these macroeconomic objectives, uh, the government may either implement fiscal policy, which we have already talked about, or it may implement a type of monetary policy. So let's talk then about types of monetary policy. And just like fiscal policy, there are two types of it and they're called the exact same thing. One is the expansionary monetary policy. The other is the contractionary monetary policy. Okay, and we are going to get into, into details in each of them, but in very simple terms, and to help you guys remember, expansionary monetary policy is when the interest rate is lowered and contractionary monetary policy is when the interest rate is increased, okay? But let's look at how that's actually done and what effect that has on the economy, okay? So what I'm going to do for the rest of this video is I'm going to talk about expansionary monetary policy, uh, work through a case study with you guys, and once I've done that, once you guys understand the mechanisms, the transmission mechanisms of an expansionary monetary policy, you guys can figure out on your own how a contractionary monetary policy works. It's effectively the opposite of what I will be talking about. So let's talk about expansionary monetary policy. And so the situation that the economy finds itself in is that we have real GDP here. Uh, we have price level here. Uh, so AD, uh, short run aggregate supply. Uh, long run aggregate supply. And so this is our equilibrium, P naught. And let's say this is why not. The interesting thing is that we are operating beneath our potential. So Y star, which is our potential is more than our uh, output right now. Okay. So we could be producing Y star, but we are producing Y not. And so the government has decided that they are going to use expansionary monetary policy to increase our output from Y naught to Y star. Okay, how will they do that? Uh, step one. Hold on, what's happening? Just give me a minute, guys. Uh, just having some technical difficulties here. Uh,
Okay, I think we are back. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so what the government has decided, as I was saying, is that they are going to use an expansionary monetary policy to increase output from why not. Okay, so what's the first step? First step is increase money supply. Now here's the important thing to remember, okay? The government or the central bank cannot do this directly, okay? I mean, there are multiple steps involved. Uh, there are things called interbank repo rate. There are things called open market operations. There are a few other things, a few more steps before one that the government have to undertake in order to increase money supply, okay? So this is important. The government or the central bank can't actually do this directly, but because I'm trying to keep things simple, uh, let's just assume for the time being that if the government wants to increase money supply in the economy, they can, okay? I mean, if you think about it, uh, it's not possible, right? The government isn't going to go around the country knocking on random doors and giving people money. That's just not how it works. So there are different mechanisms in play, but we don't need to talk about that right now. Let's just assume the government can, if they want to, increase or decrease money supply. When money supply increases, let's take a look at the money market. So we have the stock of money here. We have interest rates here. This is money supply. This is money demand. And so our equilibrium, this is how much money we have, M0. And let's say this is the interest rate, okay? Now what has happened is that money supply has increased. Because of money supply increasing, of course, the stock of money in the economy has increased. But what's more interesting for us is that we see that interest rate had gone down. Okay, so of course, I mean, that's what we would want to happen because we are implementing an expansionary monetary policy. And for expansionary monetary policy, we want interest rate to go down. So that has been achieved, okay? So first step, increase money supply, which is going to mean interest rate will fall. That is done, okay? Now let's come to step two. Step two, uh, would be, well, actually, I mean, the government only does one thing. Uh, they've just increased the money supply. Uh, so this is the money market. Let's take a look now at the loanable funds market. Okay. So we have money. Uh, sorry, no, we have loanable funds, amount of loanable funds, interest rate. We have loanable funds demand. We have loanable funds supply. Of course, this is our equilibrium, right, loanable funds. Okay, now what has happened is that money supply has increased. When money supply increases, what's going to happen in the, of course, this is the loanable funds market. What's going to happen to the loanable funds market? Nothing is going to happen to the demand for loanable funds. This remains unchanged, but the loanable funds supply 
it's going to increase because there's more money. What am I doing? Okay, let's do this. So vulnerable fund supply shifts to the right because it has increased. As a result, of course, we already knew the first thing, which is that interest rate will fall. But also interestingly, the loanable funds that's available has increased. Okay, so that's the second thing that's going to happen. Third, what's going to happen? Because interest rate has fallen, what is going to happen to consumption, to investment? Or actually, let me write down the equation in case you guys don't remember. Y equals to C plus I plus G plus NX. Hopefully, you all remember this equation. Now, because interest rate has fallen, what's going to be the effect on consumption, on investment, and on net export? If interest rate is falling, what will you do? Will you save more or will you consume more? You will probably consume more, right? So consumption goes up. If interest rate is uh, no, wait, that's not entirely accurate. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was correct. Uh, so if interest rate is low, you guys can take, of course, as you see, uh, as we see from here, that uh, the equilibrium point in the loanable funds market has increased. There's more money available, you will take more loans, uh, you will save less, and you will consume more. Uh, what happens to investment? If interest rates are low, you are going to invest more. And second of all, if interest rates are low, that also means that our exchange rate is going to go down. Our currency will become weaker. If our currency becomes weaker, we are going to export more. We are going to import less. Cumulatively, we are going to, our net export is going to increase. So this is going to increase as well. So notice that because of interest rate falling, consumption increase, investment increase, net export increase. As a result, Y is going to increase, right? So let's go back to this diagram. In, uh, interest rate has fallen. As a result, we have found that Y is going to go up. Let me write this down here. Y equals to C plus plus G plus NX, Y is going to go up, which means demand is going to go up effectively. Well, that's not nice. We end up in this situation. It's a new AD. And what we have now is that here, we've moved from Y not to Y star. And of course, price level has also gone up. So that's effectively uh, expansionary monetary policy. Okay, let me simplify all of this. When you implement expansionary monetary policy, what you're doing is you're lowering interest rate. When you lower interest rate, you are increasing your consumption you're increasing investment, uh, you're increasing net export, which effectively means increasing export and decreasing import. And when this happens, output goes up. And that's what we wanted to do, right? Our primary problem was that our output was less than the, uh, our potential so we implemented expansionary monetary policy 
and that led to our output increasing. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details about this, but what would have happened if we had implemented a contractionary monetary policy? You guys can work out all the details and the transitions, but what we would have done was decrease the money supply, which would increase interest rate. When interest rate is higher, we will save more. When we save more, we are going to consume less, we're going to invest less. And of course, a falling interest rate immediately, uh, in rising interest rate means a rising exchange rate, which would also mean that our net export situation would fall. And as a result, our output would fall. So these are the two types of expansionary monetary policy. And that's it. Okay, uh, what we have done so far, actually I'm going to summarize in the next video. I'm, I'm going to end the video right here.